I'm Steve from This Work With Cars, and I'm about to go and look at a pretty neat barn find. Driving my Austin Healy 100. Okay, it's been a couple days, and here they are. I got them all moved back to my shop. I knew that I wanted them, so I, actually I haven't taken a look at them yet. I just loaded them up and shipped them back here. It's pretty neat to have found six bug eyes all parked in a row. These cars have been sitting for approximately 30 years without moving. I think what we should do is number these cars. That way we can keep track of them. So I'll just call this one number one. Two. Three. This will be number four. Five. And six. One neat thing is you can see I have hard tops on four of these cars. I believe these three are actual factory BMC hardtops. Let's give each car a look over and then decide what we can do with these today. This car does have a front bumper. Car number two also has a front bumper. Let's take a look under the bonnet. Okay, that one was quite difficult to lift up. Uh, someone has stolen the stays that would hold the bond it up when you lift it up so I had to use the prop rod stays are these things on the side when you lift it up it latches lift it up again allows you to close the bonnet so underneath this one you can see we have a mouse nest there the regulator should be in that location there's no longer a regulator there uh, underneath the bonnet. This one does look pretty original. It's missing some hoses, the heater hoses, radiator hoses. Does have the original air cleaner still. Let's check out the inside. This car is also red on red. Looks like that's some of the original rubber mat back there. It's missing on the transmission tunnel on the floor. And the dashboard is red on this one, and it also has the original radio. You can see the soft top and the side curtains there. Looks like everything is there on the back, and this one has a black hard top on it. It looks like all of these cars are pretty much in the same shape, except for car number five down there that does not have an engine in it. I'm Steve, and this is This Week with Cars. Remember those six sprites that I found in a barn? Well, today I'd like to take a look at car number two. I want to clean it out, take a look at it, and see if I can get it running and driving today. The first things that I notice under the bonnet, I'm going to need to clean up this mouse nest, and I'm also going to need a regulator because those wires are live, so I'll need to install that before connecting the battery. This pipe right here, this is the oil pressure feed line to the oil pressure gauge. And there's also no sender for the temp sender. And that is because there is no oil and temp gauge in this car. That's missing. So I'll need to either plug that pipe or hook up a gauge before I fire the engine up or oil will be shooting out of there. I don't really need to worry about the temperature sender right now. There's not even any hoses on the radiator, but you don't need any water in it to fire it up. Over here on this side, you can see that the fuel feed line does not have a hose connecting it to the fuel pump, and that is also a non-standard fuel pump down there. But other than those things, it looks like it will be a pretty straightforward start. So now let's clean the inside out, see if we find any of these parts that we need. Door panel just fell off. For those who don't know, the correct door panels for these have this metal uh, flange stapled to them. 
a lot of the reproductions do not come with that and you just affix it straight to the door but this is the way that it was put together originally okay it's a white convertible top both sets of side curtains Here's the missing pipe that goes to the oil pressure gauge. There's some exhaust clamps here. I did notice that there was no tailpipe coming out of the back of the car. So that means there might not be any exhaust on this car. Taking a look back underneath the carburetors, there is no exhaust coming down. So this has just a straight exhaust manifold. So if we get this started, it's going to be pretty loud. In the back, these are just the panels uh, that go on the sides back here in the back. You can see all of this nice original rubber flooring here, as well as way back here in the boot. It's just a shame that it doesn't have any of the pieces that come further up here. Over here on the driver's side, just a mirror. Here's those missing bonnet stays. So that's a great find. I just need to bolt these on and then the bonnet will be held up safely. This is kind of neat. This is the original tie down for the spare tire in the boot, as well as the original door check straps. I grabbed one of those old regulators that I found in car number five last time and I sprayed some PB blaster on all these terminals to get these screws loosened up. I've seen a lot of these break off and I wanted to make sure that they went up and down easily before I broke any of them off. So now let's get this in the car and get the wiring hooked up. I got the regulator hooked up so now I can put a battery in. Just grab that and set that in there. I got the battery in but the battery cables were removed so I need one wire coming from this terminal down to the starter solenoid and another from that terminal over to that hole on the firewall. Now I'm just gonna tap the wire to the terminal, see if it sparks, it does not. So that means it's safe to connect it. Next thing to do, I suppose, would be to See if the engine has any oil in it. Sure does. I just glanced down here. This is the wire that would run to the starter and looks like this car doesn't even have a starter on it. So I'm going to need to go and grab one of those. Here's my box of Sprite starters. I already had this pulled out because the junkyard dig guys were here and they needed a starter for an MG Midget that they were working on. So I'll just grab one of these, uh, test it. If I find one that works, we'll use that and throw it in the car. Okay, it looks like this one works. Show you how you test it. Suck a battery up to it, see if it spins. So. I'll put this one in, see if the engine turns over. Now this may seem impossible at first, but you can get the starter slid into there if you take the distributor cap out and move it out of the way, and you lower the starter through this hole first with holding onto the Bendix and putting the back of the starter where the cable connects down in first. Then you can kind of move it around the distributor and get the Bendix started into the hole. Then you can just push it forward and bolt it in. Okay, I got the starter installed. It's pretty simple on the top. Just put the bolt through it, put a nut on the back. Before that lower bolt, there's an access hole in the transmission tunnel. Just pull the rubber plug out, and then you can see you have access to slip the bolt in for the starter through there. And I just use an extra long one there to make it easier to get the nut on the other side. I have the starter completely hooked up, so let's give it a go. Hmm. 
nothing. So I'm going to pull the spark plugs out real quick. We'll uh, take the compression off of it. All right, let's see if we can see anything down in there. Looks a bit rusted inside number one. Number two looks nice. Number three looks nice. Number four also looks a little rusted. Set the starter again. Since I already had the spark plugs out, I sprayed a little bit of lubricant in there. And I've taken the nut off of this cable that goes down to the starter. As you can see, power is going to the starter. What I'm gonna try is, I'm gonna try hitting the starter with this large object while I'm applying power to it and seeing if we can get it to spin. Normally at this point, I would put the car in gear and rock it back and forth, uh, trying to get the wheels to turn the engine over. But when I did that, the car still rolled. So I don't think there's a drive shaft installed on this car right now. So I'm going to have to go back in my parts and find a drive shaft, put the car on the lift and get the drive shaft on it. So that's going to have to wait for another episode. So I think this is as far as I can go today. That's it today for Sprite number two. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Was With Cars and behind me is Barn Sprite number two. It's been a few months since I've uh, worked on this car. Today I'd like to get back at this car, see if we can get it running. Uh, last time we left off with the engine seized, but I couldn't turn it because I didn't have a drive shaft. Well, I've gone through my parts and I did come up with a drive shaft. So I'll put the drive shaft in. We'll see if we can rock the car back and forth and break the engine free. If we can, then we'll go from there and see if we can get it running. Well, this is unexpected. This is the first time I've had the car actually on the lift. I came under here to put the drive shaft in and discovered there is no differential either. So I'm going to have to look around, see if I can come up one one of those. I'll have to take the axles out first. Uh, get the center section set in there, and then I can put the drive shaft on. I went and looked through my parts boxes. I found this differential back there. It looks like to be a good one. Gears look good, turns smooth. Um, everything seems to work pretty good smoothly on it. So I'll need to get the axles pulled out and I'll put this in. Then we can uh, continue to see if we can break that engine free. Looks like when they painted the car, they must have had the wheels off of it. Everything in here is spray painted red. Then they must have come back with some black, sprayed that in the wheel wells. This isn't the way you should paint a car today, but I know it's typical of what it was done in the 70s. And there we have it. There's an axle shaft. I don't have to pull it completely out. I can leave it out a little bit. I just need to get it out of the area of the housing so that I can slip the center section in. So I need to pull the axle out of the other side and then we can install the differential. There's no trick to getting this in other than just setting it up on there. I'm going to squeeze some sealant in around it uh, of course, you can use the paper gaskets, but in my opinion, those are always going to leak on you. So use some sealant here. Get this to seal good. Now I can just slide my drive shaft forward, engage it with the center section. 
Need to get the holes lined up. Looks like I have it clocked 90 degrees. So need to rotate it. There we go. Now I just need to tighten these up and set the car back on the ground. We can move it back and forth, see if we can break the engine free. Now that the center section is bolted in, I can put the axles back in. This can be a little frustrating because uh, the splines on the axle and the splines on the differential are not gonna line up. This is also not piloted all the way, so you actually have to lift it up a little bit to get it in, started into the bearing on the differential. So you're gonna just have to wiggle it around a little bit until you get to the magic spot where it's gonna uh, slide in. Just keep wiggling it until it slides in. Before I put the shoe back on, I'm going to crank the adjuster back a couple clicks. That way it'll make the drum easier to put on and take back off. Obviously I'm going to have to get back in here to service the brakes in another episode. When you put your drum back on, make sure that these two holes, which accept a screw, go in there. And there's also a little hole that will allow you to check to make sure that this screw is tightened as well. So you want to orient it. You can install it any way you want to, but there's only one direction where all of these things line up. There should be a screw that goes in here as well. It was missing. I'm just going to leave it off for now, but I'll have to order that screw and put one in here when I'm doing the brakes. Another thing you want to line up is this hole right here lines up with this hole on the brake drum and that allows you to rotate this later on to get to that brake adjuster if you need to adjust your brakes in and out. And if these two holes are not lined up, you won't be able to do that without taking the wheel off. I'm going to go finish the other side, then I can put the car back down on its wheels and we'll get on to the next task. Okay, here's the moment I've been waiting for, for what? Uh, two or three months since I made the other video. Uh, before I try to uh, see if it'll break free, I'm gonna take a little bit of penetrating oil, spray it down into the cylinders. Okay, I have the car in fourth gear right now, so if I push the car back and forth, it should try to turn the engine, and uh, well, let's see what happens. Okay, did you see that? The generator was moving a little bit, so that means the engine is moving a little bit. It is uh, locked up enough that it's not going to make one full rotation, but this is a good sign, it is moving a little bit, so I'm just gonna have to keep working it and hope that it keeps moving a little bit more every single time until I've made an entire rotation. Well, I think I'm going to hit it with penetrating oil again, and I'm going to let it sit overnight. See if it can help us get this engine broken free. The engine has set overnight. The transmission is still in fourth gear, which will be the easiest to get it to turn. I'm just gonna push on it. You can see how easily the engine is rotating now as I move the car.
The next thing to do is to take it out of gear and see if the starter will turn it. Right, the car is in neutral. This is my power wire running to the starter. Let's see if the starter can turn the engine now. Okay, that's a good sign. Now that the engine turns over, I can put the spark plugs back in. We'll put some fuel to it and see if we can get it started. Okay, this spark plug, I noticed the top is spinning. This one's probably not any good. So I'm gonna go find another set of plugs and we'll throw in a set of new ones. If the engine starts, I will need to plug this oil line. I don't have a gauge took up to it right now, so I'm just going to use a hose with a screw on the end so I can plug that up so that when the engine builds up oil pressure, it isn't spraying oil everywhere. I need to cut this old fuel line off. That way I can get the fuel dripper, little IV bottle hooked up there. Easiest way to get these old fuel hoses off is to cut them, they're way too hard. Now I can connect up the fuel bottle. We'll open up the valve, let the fuel bowls fill up. We'll see what happens. Okay, this one's full. It's actually leaking out of the bottom of the carb now. And give this one a little tap. Make sure that it's open. Okay, I'm gonna shut the fuel off now. In the last video on this car, I had just taken a regulator that I had sitting around and I just connected up to the wiring. None of that has been tested yet, and so to get power to the coil, I'm just going to run a lead straight from the battery to the coil so that I know that it's powered up and I don't have to worry about the rest of the wiring. At this point, I'd just like to see if this engine runs. Let's hit the starter and see what happens. It's like the starter doesn't want to turn it with the spark plugs in. I think I'm gonna take the spark plugs back out. That way we can check for spark and we can also clean some more of that oil out. Okay, I think I have an issue. Every time I've used the starter to turn the engine over, the engine has been locked up so the starter can't turn it again. I think one of my major issues is this old starter that I just got out of the box. And I think in order to get this to run, I'm going to have to get that starter rebuilt. So it looks like again today, this car has defeated me. I just don't have enough parts lying around to get it to run. It's extremely close. I know that it should run, but it's just not going to run today. So I'm gonna get the starter out, go get that rebuilt, and we'll get this running in another video. And for the rest of today, before the sun goes down, I want to get this car out and finally wash it. I'm really curious to see what this is going to look like. Just like Barn Sprite 1, we found a pretty nice paint job underneath all that dust and dirt and grime and... I love the black hardtop with the red paint. Once this car is polished up, it should look pretty nice. Well that's it today for Barn Sprite number two. I thought I would spend most of this video 
getting the car running, but instead I was replacing parts that I didn't even know were missing off of the car. That means uh, in the next video I should be able to get not only the car running, but get the car driving. So if you like videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Week With Cars, and this is Barn Sprite number two. If you haven't been watching my previous videos, I pulled six almost identical bug eyes out of a barn where they have been sitting for who knows 30, 40 years. Barn Sprite number one is already back and running, it's cleaned up. Barn Sprite number six has been painted pink, and right now I'm concentrating on Barn Sprite number two and trying to get it running. Today I don't want to quit until I actually get Barn Sprite two running. So let's get at it. Underneath the bonnet, you can see down there I have the restored starter installed. Uh, last time I was having issues with that starter. The car actually didn't come with a starter and I found that one in a box. Obviously it was bad. Uh, so that's been rebuilt. I got that in. I do have a lead hooked up to the battery so that we can test and see if we have spark. And this cable right here activates the starter. So first thing we need to do if we want to start the engine, see if we have spark. So I'll turn the light off. We'll look down here. So we can see the points. Turn the engine over. And you could not see any sparks down there at the distributor. So that means I need to clean the points up, see if we can get a spark on this distributor. Uh, the points here cleaned with the file now. Turn the light off again. We'll try it again. So now that the points are working, I'll put the rotor and the distributor cap back on. And as long as the cap and the leads are good, put the spark plugs back in and we'll try to fire it up. First I need the rotor. Right on the inside of the cap you can see that there is some corrosion on the side so I'm going to take my Dremel real quick and clean that up. My Dremel has a little wire brush on it. Doesn't take much to get those cleaned up. And the coil is still the original screw in type. Previously, I had purchased new spark plugs. I think one of them was damaged. I'm going to fill up the carburetors again, just like last time. Drain the fuel out of this uh, little jug here. I can hear him filling up right now. Okay, I'll shut it off. I have a wire run to the ignition from the battery. I'm gonna hold the chokes up and let's give it a go. It's a good sign. wants to go. I'm going to try to give it a little bit of throttle. Well, it runs. I'm not sure why I shut off. Oh, it shook my lead to the ignition off. That's why it shut down. Let's run it for a little bit longer.
underneath the car now. You can see the exhaust manifold up there. So I need an exhaust that comes down. Going back behind the floor here. This is one of the original exhaust hangers. It's still in place. Someone must have been using this as an exhaust hanger. And back here, I don't know why the bumper mounts are uh, look like that. It looks like they've been patched in. Not sure why, that's kind of strange. But there should be an exhaust mount uh, back in this area as well. But for right now, we can use the wire that someone left here as well as what's left of the original mount. Now I just need an exhaust system. The people of YouTube are always accusing me of lying. So I'll bring you along on my adventure this time. Here's an exhaust clamp, we'll need that. This is a pile of stuff that was in the car when I got it. So we'll need this. Set this up here for now. Now all we need is a full exhaust system. Here's my Land Cruiser that I decorated for Christmas. Has all the lights all over it. Very nice. I know I have a brand new exhaust back over there in the corner, but I have some used ones sitting over here. I think I have a couple in between the moke here. I was going to use a, maybe one of these to make an exhaust for the Morris Minor. Obviously I don't need two. I need one for this car, so I'll just grab one of these. Looks like I have a couple more clamps sitting here. So take one of these and we'll put it on our bug eye. Here's the exhaust that I chose. It did have a bracket in the front. This will bolt right up there on the transmission. Looks like I'll have to flatten it a little and get this weird cable off of there. In the back, I have it slip through here. Looks like a tab can be welded back on here. Uh, there's the original threaded bolt there that the original hanger held on. That's gonna line up pretty nice. So, get this mounted first and then I can clamp the exhaust on to the exhaust manifold. Okay we got the lower mount installed. Of course the exhaust now has gotten on the wrong side of the steering column so I'm gonna have to loosen these back up make sure that I hold it in the right position then tighten them back up again. Now I can put the car back down, go up there, and put the exhaust clamp on. It's real hard to see in there, but you can see I have the clamp on the exhaust there. One thing that helped me out is I have the bottom of the exhaust being held up by a jack so it could push it up against the exhaust manifold until I got the clamp in place. The next big thing on the road to making this drivable is to have a working clutch. So let's take a look in the master cylinder here. It's pretty rusty in there. Looks like somehow, almost looks like there's mouse droppings in there. It's not even worth putting fluid in there, seeing if that one works. Even if it did work, I'd just end up uh, putting dirt through the whole system, so gonna have to pull that out and put a new master cylinder in. So to keep the engine running, I have verified that the fuel pump runs. This one does have a lever on the bottom. If I push down on the pump, you can hear it running. And I did put my finger over the pump and verify that it is making vacuum. So I'm pretty sure the pump is going to work. I'll just have to hook up some new fuel lines and I will also have to replace all the hoses that go from the water pump to the radiator 
and to the heater core, uh, replace all those. Then I can put some coolant into the radiator. Actually, I'll have to see if the radiator is even any good or if that needs rebuilt. But we're getting really close on the engine. So next time, I'll pull out the master cylinder and we'll do all the hydraulics on this car. Well, it looks like that's as much time as I have for today. If you haven't already done so, click the subscribe button. YouTube gives creators tools based solely on the number of subscribers they have. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Week With Cars and today I want to take another look at Barn Sprite number two. Today I want to put the master cylinder in, get the clutch working, and rebuild the carburetors. And hopefully after all that we'll be able to take it outside and take it for a drive. I'm going to do the carbs and the brakes simultaneously so I'll get both of them unbolted now. That way when I have the carbs and the ultrasonic cleaner I can be working on the brakes or vice versa. So I'll just get these off. When you're doing the master cylinder you could take it out without taking this whole assembly out but I find that it's a whole lot easier to just take the pedals and this bracketry out and swap your master cylinder that way. So you just need a 7 16 socket to take these bolts out and the whole assembly will come out of there. With the master cylinder removed, I want to get the carburetors out of here as well. Take them out, uh, bolted together still. Then I can do it all on the bench. It's a lot easier than doing it here. Once you have the pedal assembly out of the car, it's actually very easy to replace the master cylinder. It just uses two bolts that pass through the master cylinder, just like on a Morris Minor. And you don't really have to take anything else off. You just take the two bolts off, put your new master cylinder in there, and call it done. A lot of times this cavity down here is filled with all kinds of crud. Uh, you know, as brake fluid leaks down here, it will eat off all the paint and rust it out in here. This one is in incredibly good shape. Usually you don't see these in such good shape. So it makes me wonder if someone has repainted this once or if this car just really doesn't have a lot of miles on it. And there we have it. The master cylinder is ready to be put back in. I'll just pull my two plugs out right there hook up the brake lines and it'll be ready to bleed and here's the carburetors you can see the condition of them a lot of dust looks like there's a lot of red overspray all over them these are the original air cleaners for these carburetors and these are also smaller the mark one sprites use smaller carburetors than all the rest of the sprites did and this is a much more antiquated design than the other models use uh, one big upgrade is to take the newer carbs and intake manifold from a different Sprite and put it onto a Mark I Sprite. And of course, many people swap the entire 1275 engine from a later Sprite into these Mark I Sprites, which gives you a much better engine and a lot more power. I can feel that a lot of parts on this carb are loose. That's why it was leaking so bad. Also, it's missing some screws especially here on the top of the dash pots. So uh, I'm not sure what was going on. Someone must have taken this apart and did not reassemble it fully. So I'm gonna disassemble this, reassemble it, and we'll get it back on the car. I have the master cylinder reinstalled now. So the next thing I need to do on the clutch side to make the car drivable is replace the clutch slave cylinder. And that's underneath the car uh, next to the transmission. Luckily, the slave cylinder on the Mark I Sprites do not use a hose, so it's actually a hard line all the way from here down to the slave cylinder. Right here is the old slave cylinder. It's just held on by two bolts, and of course the hard line is connected right back here. So I just need to undo the hard line, the two bolts, and this rod will pop right out. 
and I'll get this out and get it replaced. I've run into a little problem. The bolt that holds on the slave cylinder on that side is actually hitting the frame and it won't come out any further. So maybe the transmission mount has collapsed a little bit. So I'm gonna take a jack and I'm going to try to hold the transmission up with this jack. I'll crank it up and push up on the transmission and hopefully I'll be able to get the bolt out then. There we go, now I have enough room to get the slave cylinder out. Here's the new slave cylinder. Looks just like the old one. Just bolt it back up. And then here's the bleeder here. So I'll bleed the air out of the system and I should have a working clutch. While I've been working in this little area, I noticed that there's a threaded hole right here. Now this is for the ground strap that's supposed to go between this bolt and the chassis right here. It connects the engine to a good ground. And without that, your starter may not run right. And if you have a Sprider midget, a lot of times you'll have work done on the car and someone will forget to put this ground strap back on. So it's a good thing to take a look underneath your car and make sure that the ground strap is still here. So I'll have to get one for this car and get that installed. Most of the time you have carpet covering this, and there is a rubber plug that goes in this hole, but this is how you access the bleeder for the slave cylinder. The clutch should be working now. I'm gonna go up and push the clutch pedal. We should be able to watch this rod come out and push the clutch in. I did change all three of the brake hoses. Obviously there's one on each side in the front. And then it has a single hose in the back, right here. And then it's hard line that splits off to each side. So now with the brakes bled and the clutch bled, if I put the carburetors on, I should have a drivable car now. While I've been working on the clutch and the brakes, I've had the carburetor part sitting in the ultrasonic cleaner. So it's time to start pulling them out. Them right there. And wiping them off and getting them cleaned up and reassemble it. You can see how much better these parts look than when I took them apart. They had all that red overspray on them. They had grease, they had oil. Now it's perfectly clean metal. So I think you get the idea. Put the parts in the ultrasonic cleaner, let it clean them up. Then uh, take them out, clean them off, blow through them uh, with an air gun, make sure all the water gets out. Once you are to this point in the assembly, this is where you need to f set your first initial setting. And we want to bring the jet. You can see it moves up and down as I pull the choke up. So the further down that goes, the more fuel that you're going to get. Well, to start our initial setting on this, I want to turn the nut on the bottom to bring that up flush. And that's where we're going to start from. You don't actually thread it up until it stops moving. You want to try to get that as flush as possible. So taking a real flat piece of metal that you can stick in there and feel when it's actually flush is a good idea so that you know that you have it in the exact right spot. Now that I have it in the starting position that I want, I've shown you this before, I like to mark the face on the nut that is facing forward so you remember where you started from. And this will help you keep track of things as you're tuning the carb. And now what I'm going to do to set my initial setting, I'm going to unscrew this nut two full turns and that will be my starting point on these carburetors. The rest of the tuning will be done with it installed on the car and the engine running. And that will be my starting point right there. You can see where the jet is sitting in relation to the top there. When it was installed in the car before, it was much further down. And the choke works very smooth now. Unlike the later SUs, these do not use a spring that sits on here to push the piston down out of the dashpot cover. It actually uses a weight that's built into the piston. 
So one really important thing is that when you reassemble it, you wanna make sure that when you push the piston up, that it freely falls back down. Otherwise it's going to get stuck. You can see here that the piston moves up and down very freely in this orientation. But if I were to turn the dash pot 180 degrees and hold it in that position, the piston sticks and does not fall back down. But if I return it back to the original position, these are such finely machined parts that now the piston does work correctly. It's important to test all the parts as you're putting it together to make sure that you know where the problems lie. Do you remember that I was missing one of the screws for the dash pot covers? Well, when you're searching through your parts bin for a suitable screw, make sure to remember that those are going to be a Whitworth thread. Don't go trying to shove any regular type of screw in there. Yeah, the threads will not be the same. Here they are, all cleaned up and ready to go. This looks like a huge difference compared to what they look like when I took them off. I am going to leave the air cleaners off for now because I have to have them off for sinking the carbs and tuning them. So this is the condition that I'm going to just bolt them back on the car. One unfortunate thing about the Mark I Sprites is that without the air cleaner, you would have to bolt this back on without their cleaners because that's what works your chokes because this is normally bolted on behind the air cleaners which makes it a real pain when you need to take these off to change them and that's why i like using an air cleaner that has a removable front on it that way you can leave this whole assembly in place and uh, get to sinking and tuning the carbs without having to take it all apart i have the carbs back on let's see if it'll start i'm going to hold the chokes up to help it start. This does have a mechanical fuel pump, so it'll take a minute for the fuel to fill up the fuel bowls before it'll start. I think it's finally time. Let's see if this will drive. Ignition is on. Full starter. See if the clutch works. It does. I don't have any mirrors right now, so I have to be careful backing up. Up 
Well, there you go. Barn Sprite number two is now drivable. It's not really drivable on the road yet, but it does run and drive. I've had to throw some used parts at this car. I put a rear end in, I had to get a drive shaft, and I used two screws for the carburetors that I had sitting around. As far as new parts, I put in a master cylinder, a slave cylinder for the clutch, and all new radiator hoses, and some spark plugs. So besides that, the ignition system is all like I found it in the barn besides the spark plugs. The carburetors, I haven't thrown any parts at it besides the two screws. All I've done is clean them and put them back on. Hopefully in the next video I'll be finishing this car and getting it ready so that I can sell it. And if you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Week With Cars and this is my 1961 Austin Healey Sprite. And this car could be yours. It is for sale on eBay right now, and I will put a link to the auction in the description below. By serial number, this car is one of about the last 4,000 Mark I Sprites built. This car was built in late 1960 and would not have arrived in America and been sold until 1961. And it is typical in America for foreign cars to be registered under the year of which they were first sold. Normally I would take these cars for a drive, but today it is barely above zero degrees Fahrenheit and I would definitely get wind chill if I took it out, not to mention the salt and the dirt on the roads right now. I do have a little bit of footage of this car while I was working on it, so I'll put that at the end of the video, but I will not be able to take this for a drive today. I will do a cold start for you, as well as a tour both right here and on the lift to show you the condition of the car. This car is one of six Mark I Sprites that I found in a line in a barn, and I've been referring to this one as Barn Sprite number two. So if you want to see previous videos on this car, look up Barn Sprite number two on my YouTube channel. This is a great car and would be a great project for someone, so let's take a look at it. On the front, you can see it does have the optional front bumper. However, most of the cars that came to the United States were equipped with the front bumper. The Sprite emblem on the bonnet is there, however, it has become cracked and does need replaced. I don't know how well you can see it on the camera, but there is a little bit of crazing in the paint. You can see it well right there. However, from a distance, the paint looks very well. There are some spots here and there where the paint is flaking off here and on one of the rocker panels over on this side. You can see it right there. Continuing around the front, there is some blemishes here in the top of the grill, as well as a blemish in the paint right here. There's also one spot on the middle of the bonnet right there where the paint has started to flake off a little bit. Everything looks quite a bit better here on the passenger side. There is no flaking of the paint on the bottom of the rockers like there was on the driver's side. This car does wear its original wheels and hubcaps. Along the back, you see the original gas filler cap, and these are glass as was equipped originally. Has the original gold Sprite emblem. There is some flaking of the paint here on the plinth for the license plate lamp. It has an original style exhaust fitted. However, the exhaust is old it's rusted up near where it attaches to the engine and should be replaced. These tires are the ones that were fitted to the car when I got it, so I would recommend putting new tires on it before you drive it on the road. The top of the boot looks good. There is crazing in the paint. You can see a little bit right there. However, there is no chipping. I can't take it for a drive today, but we can try a cold start on it. Get the choke pulled out. Hit the starter switch. Try it again. How it is, uh, if you can see that thermometer up there, it is less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit in here right now. Let's try it again. It needs a new cable that runs to the generator. I 
I also have for the car the original jack and jack handle, the side curtains, the convertible top, and the convertible top bows. On the inside of the car, the only new parts are the shift knob. I did powder coat the uh, gear cover there and the oil and water gauge. That is new as well. So behind the seats, original rubber mat here and on the wheel wells. And you can see the condition of the trunk here. There is no mat from the hump back. That's just bare metal, painted metal there. Under the bonnet, I had the starter rebuilt. That's way down there. You can see the rebuilt starter down there. I did put on a new radiator cap. The master cylinder is new. As well as the slave cylinder for the clutch. Of course, has a new battery and battery cables. The spark plugs are new as well as the points and the distributor. I did replace those. And it also has a new rotor in the distributor. All of the coolant hoses have been replaced and I did have to put a water pump on it because the original one was leaking. So there is a new water pump in there as well. There is a bunch of wiring from the bonnet that still needs to be sorted out. I labeled what some of the wiring goes to. The regulator is not held on by anything although it is wired up. The generator is not working. Needs the cable for the tack that comes off the back of it as well. Here's a look underneath the car. You can see someone has been jacking it up from that cross member there. I did put a new ground on it and you can see the new clutch slave there. I did put all new brake hoses on it. And on the passenger side, I did replace the rear brake cylinder. That one was leaking, so I put a new one on there. Obviously the engine leaks oil. They all leak oil. If you buy this car, I would reseal the motor. You might want to do some other things as well. There has been a patch here in the floor. This is right under uh, the foot well for the driver. On the passenger side, actually looks pretty good there. Continuing back on the car, everything looks pretty stock back here. The car is missing the rear exhaust hanger back here. Behind the wheels, you can see someone has patched a sign in on that side. The other side is unpatched, but you can see a little bit of rust here in the corner. It's not actually too bad considering how old this car is. The rear spring mount areas are look to be in good shape and solid on both sides. There is a little bit of rust there in front of the rear tire. Here's a look at the wheel wells. The rocker panels seem to be in good shape.
Well, this is it for Barn Sprite number two. The uh, transport is here to pick it up and send it to the new buyer. And uh, they are on the East Coast, so maybe some of you will see this car around. So I'll get it started, get it over to the trailer, and it'll be off to the new owner. I've got the choke out all the way. Key is off. Just like that, Barn Sprite number two is getting loaded and off to the new owner.